You know what's truly amusing? I chuckled, adjusting my ceremonial robes as I addressed the gathered council members. The fact that we're all sitting here, in our grand high council chamber, pretending we don't have a human-sized problem growing right under our sophisticated noses. My name is Crix Valos, ambassador of the Centauri Alliance to the Galactic Federation, and I'm about to tell you how we managed to make the biggest mistake in our collective 50 year history. Oh, and when I say we, I mean these pompous bureaucrats who thought they could treat humans like some primitive spacefaring species. Not that I didn't try to warn them. The council chamber hung suspended in the heart of New Geneva Station, its crystalline walls refracting the light of three nearby suns. Quite dramatic, really. Perfect setting for the beginning of our downfall. High Counselor Zena Trell, with her characteristic silver-scaled elegance, shot me one of her famous maintain proper decorum glares, the kind that would make lesser beings shrink into their gravity seats. Ambassador Valos, she said, her voice carrying that perfect blend of authority and condescension. Perhaps you could enlighten us with actual facts rather than colorful observations? Facts? Oh, I have facts. I projected the latest trade violation reports onto the central hollow display. In the past solar cycle alone, we've documented 47 instances of human vessels. How shall I put this? Creatively interpreting our trade regulations. General Dax Voro, that massive mountain of cybernetic enhancements and military doctrine, rumbled from his reinforced seat. They're testing our patience, probing our defenses. Classic human behavior. Testing our patience? I laughed, probably a bit too loudly. No, my dear general, they're making us look like fools, and we're too busy being offended to notice the bigger picture. The hollow display shifted to show the latest incident. The human vessel Lucky Strike, and don't get me started on their ship names, had somehow managed to deliver medical supplies to three sanctioned worlds while our patrol ships were conveniently experiencing navigation system glitches. This Captain Sarah Rodriguez, I continued highlighting the human commander's file, submitted perfectly filed paperwork for a completely different route. The timestamps show she was exactly where she was supposed to be, while simultaneously being spotted by civilians on Proxima 6. Either humans have mastered quantum superposition, or they're playing us for the bureaucratic sticklers we are. A murmur of discomfort rippled through the chamber. Nobody likes being called out, especially not the most powerful beings in the galaxy. What would you have us do? Counselor Trell's aide, a nervous little proximate named Jix, squeaked. Treat every human ship as a potential threat? Oh no, I replied, my tone dripping with sarcasm. Let's keep doing what we're doing, because clearly sending strongly worded notices and trade violation fines is working wonderfully. I especially enjoyed how Captain Rodriguez paid her last fine with something called Monopoly money. Apparently a highly valued earth currency. The chamber erupted in outraged gasps. I continued warming to my theme, but here's what really keeps me up at night. While we're all focused on these trade violations, has anyone bothered to ask why humans are so interested in those particular sanctioned worlds? Or why their ship's energy signatures have been gradually changing over the past five years? Or perhaps why their diplomatic responses have become increasingly amused? General Voro's cybernetic eye word as he focused on me. Explain. Take their latest diplomatic note. I pulled up the message, sent by their ambassador Chen. Quote, we appreciate the Federation's continued guidance in helping humanity find its place among the stars. Does that sound like submission to you? Or does it sound like someone trying very hard not to laugh while writing an official document? High Counselor Trell raised her hand, silencing the growing murmurs. You've made your point, Ambassador Valos. What do you propose? I looked around the chamber at all these powerful beings who'd spent centuries maintaining the status quo. I propose we stop treating humans like they're playing our game and start considering the possibility that they've been playing their own game all along. Because right now, we're acting like the universe's strictest librarians while they're rewriting the books right under our noses. The silence that followed was almost perfect. Almost, except for the quiet beeping of another trade violation alert appearing on the hollow display. Oh, look, I said cheerfully, the lucky strike just did it again. The thing about diplomatic missions to Earth, they're like trying to nail water to a wall, 
technically possible with the right technology, but completely missing the point. Take our last three attempts. First, we sent Ambassador Trellix, our most seasoned negotiator. The humans hosted him in a place called Texas. He returned two weeks later, wearing something called a cowboy hat, speaking in a strange accent, and insisting we needed something called barbecue in the Federation. Complete disaster. And now, I announced to the Council, a month after my first warning, we've lost another colony monitoring station to human expansion. They're calling it New Montana. They built it in three weeks. It has a population of 50,000, and they're already exporting something called space cattle. General Dax Voro slammed his cybernetic fist on the table. This is outrageous. They can't just build colonies wherever they want. Apparently they can, I replied pulling up the latest maps. And before you ask, yes, they filed all the proper paperwork. Every single form was completed perfectly, notarized, and submitted in triplicate. They even included a gift basket with each submission. The bureaucrats are still arguing over whether accepting the artisanal coffee beans constitutes a bribe. High Counselor Trell's scales had lost some of their shine. What about the containment protocols we implemented last cycle? Oh, those were brilliant. I couldn't keep the sarcasm from my voice. We set up checkpoints on all major trade routes. The humans responded by establishing what they call scenic routes. We restricted their access to class two hyperlanes. They started using class one routes that we thought were too unstable for safe travel. Turns out they've been stabilizing them somehow. Impossible. General Voro's cybernetic eye was spinning so fast it was making me dizzy. Those routes have been unstable for millennia. Tell that to the human cruise liner that just established a weekly historic hyperlane heritage tour. They're serving champagne and charging premium rates for the view. The second diplomatic mission had gone even worse than the first. We sent a delegation of our finest minds to Earth's United Nations. They came back raving about something called pizza and submitted a 300-page report that mostly focused on Earth's culinary diversity. The actual diplomatic discussions were summarized in one sentence. They smiled a lot and agreed to everything while doing exactly what they wanted anyway. The trade sanctions, Counselor Trell insisted, they must be having some effect. I pulled up the latest economic reports. Human trade has dropped by exactly the required percentage with every sanctioned world. Exactly, to the decimal point. Meanwhile, a new human shipping company called Totally Not A Front LLC has seen a 500% increase in business. They're registered out of something called the Cayman Islands Space Station. The third diplomatic mission never even made it to Earth. The delegation got caught up in something called a music festival on Mars and went native. Last I heard, they're running a fusion restaurant combining Centaurian cuisine with something called Tex-Mex. We imposed the blockade three days ago, General Voro growled. At least that should slow them down. About that, I brought up the latest sensor readings. Remember how human ships were changing their energy signatures? Well, now they're not showing up on our sensors at all. But somehow, all the worlds behind our blockade are still getting their deliveries. When questioned, local authorities just shrug and say the goods fell off a truck. Fell off a truck? Counselor Trell looked puzzled. In space? It's a human expression, I explained. It means, actually, I have no idea what it means but they say it with this particular smile that makes our legal experts very nervous. The council chamber had grown unusually quiet, the kind of quiet that happens when a bunch of very powerful beings suddenly realize they might not be as in control as they thought. Their expansion rate is increasing, I continued, displaying a series of charts. They've established 15 new colonies in the time we've spent discussing this. They're building faster than we can update our maps. And here's the really interesting part. They're all in positions that would be strategically vital if someone were planning to, oh, I don't know, systematically dismantle a galactic power structure? You can't seriously be suggesting, General Voro began, that humans have been playing a long game while we've been reacting to their moves like novices in a strategy sim. That's exactly what I'm suggesting. Look at this pattern. I overlaid their colony positions with our major supply routes. They're not expanding randomly. They're building a web, and we're sitting right in the middle of it. What do they want? Jix asked, his voice barely a whisper. I laughed. Want? 
They've been telling us what they want from the beginning. Every diplomatic note, every trade agreement, every colony application, they want to be treated as equals. But we were too busy being the wise ancient federation to notice that while we were saying no, they were building workarounds to every obstacle we put in their path. Then we'll put up bigger obstacles, General Voro declared. Because that's worked so well so far? I shook my head. You know what humans call our containment attempts? Character-building exercises. They're treating our most serious diplomatic efforts like some sort of game. And the truly terrifying part is that they're winning without even trying to compete on our terms. The latest reports float across the hollow display. Another human colony established. Another trade route discovered. Another Federation regulation creatively reinterpreted. We're not containing them, I concluded. We're teaching them every weakness in our system. And they're very, very good students. The silence that followed was broken by a cheerful ping from the communication system. Another human diplomatic message. Thank you for your recent blockade initiative. It has provided valuable insights into alternative logistic solutions. We look forward to continuing our productive relationship with the Federation. P.S. We've attached a gift basket. The coffee is from our new colony in the Orion sector. Enjoy. Well, I said brightly, at least we're getting good coffee out of this impending catastrophe. You know what's worse than humans outsmarting you? Certain idiots in the Federation deciding to start making human ships disappear because that worked out just great for everyone involved. Twelve ships, I announced to the emergency council session. Twelve human ships have vanished in the past month, and before anyone tries to blame spatial anomalies, random quantum fluctuations, or whatever creative excuse the military has prepared, let me say this. The humans know exactly what happened. The council chamber was unusually full. Nothing brings out the politicians like impending disaster. Ambassador Valos, General Voro rumbled, you have no proof of Federation involvement. Really? I projected the latest communication from Earth. Commander Lyra Blake sent this message an hour ago. Should I read it, or would you prefer to explain why your routine patrol ships were spotted at every disappearance point? High Counselor Trell nodded reluctantly. Proceed. To the Galactic Federation Council, I read, noting the complete lack of usual diplomatic fluff. We have tracked your Pattern 7 stealth vessels at the locations of all 12 missing ships. We have documented your energy weapon signatures. We have recovered debris showing clear signs of military-grade plasma damage. We even have your ship's registration numbers, which you really should have changed, by the way. I paused for effect. The chamber was dead silent. You have 48 hours to return our people, all of them, alive and unharmed. You also have 48 hours to identify and surrender everyone involved in authorizing these attacks. This is not a negotiation. This is not a threat. This is us being exceptionally patient. Commander Blake has clearly overstepped. General Voro began. Oh, I'm not finished, I interrupted. There's a postscript. P.S. We've already rescued our people. This ultimatum is a courtesy to let you do the right thing on your own. You really don't want us to handle this our way. The council erupted in chaos. Accusations flew back and forth. Demands for explanations mixed with calls for immediate military action. Silence! High Counselor Trell's voice cut through the noise. General Voro, explain yourself. The general's cybernetic components whirred anxiously. A small faction within military command may have exceeded their authority, but the humans were becoming too powerful, too quickly. We needed to send a message. A message, I laughed bitterly. The only message you sent was, please demonstrate why antagonizing humans is a spectacularly bad idea. Tell them about the rescue, General. Tell them what happened to your secret prison station. We were not sure, Voro admitted. The station's there, but everyone inside was gone. No signs of forced entry, no alarm triggers, just empty cells and a note saying, thanks for the hospitality, pinned to the warden's chair. Along with a recipe for chocolate chip cookies, I added, apparently the prison's kitchen facilities were criminally underutilized. This is absurd, one of the junior counselors protested. They can't just, just what, infiltrate our most secure facility? 
rescue their people without firing a shot? Leave baked goods as a calling card? Apparently they can. And now they're giving us the chance to admit our mistakes before they run out of patience. The hollow display lit up with another message from Earth. Commander Blake's face appeared, and I had to admire her perfectly polite expression. Since our last communication, we've noticed increased military activity in Federation space, she said pleasantly. We trust this means you're working on complying with our request, not preparing for further foolishness. As a reminder, you have 39 hours remaining. Also, the cookies we left? The recipe calls for vanilla extract, not vanilla substitute. The difference matters. The message ended, leaving the council in stunned silence. They're bluffing, General Voro declared. They can't possibly. General, I interrupted. In the past six months, humans have outmaneuvered our every attempt at containment, turned our trade sanctions into business opportunities, and apparently developed technology that makes our best stealth detection systems look like children's toys. Do you really want to bet the future of the Federation on them bluffing? We are the Galactic Federation, High Counselor Trell stated firmly. We do not bow to ultimatums. No, I agreed. We just watch as humans systematically demonstrate how paper-thin our authority really is. They're not even trying to hide their capabilities anymore. They want us to know they could have done worse. Much worse. What do you suggest? Jix asked nervously. I suggest we... I started, but another message interrupted me. Commander Blake again, still smiling. Apologies for the additional message, but we noticed your military vessels taking up attack formations. As a friendly warning, you might want to check on your long-range sensor arrays. All of them. No rush. You have 38 hours and 47 minutes remaining. The message ended just as reports started flooding in. Every single long-range sensor array in Federation space had gone dark. No damage. No alarms. Just off. Well, I said to the stun council, I suggest we start identifying those responsible for the attacks. Unless anyone else has a brilliant idea for how to deal with a species that apparently turns our most secure military assets off and on like light switches, the silence that followed was deafening. 38 hours and 45 minutes, I reminded them. But who's counting? Have you ever watched someone make a decision so monumentally stupid that you can actually feel the universe holding its breath? That's what happened when General Voro decided to attack Nova Haven. You did what? My voice echoed through the council chamber, now in permanent emergency session. You attacked a civilian colony? After everything that's happened, you actually thought that was a good idea? The general stood defiant, though his cybernetics were glitching from stress. We had to show strength. Nova Haven was their newest colony, barely defended, a precision strike to demonstrate. To demonstrate that we've completely lost our minds? I pulled up the attack footage. Look at this. Your precision strike hit their schools, their hospitals, their residential zones. Do you have any idea what you've done? High Counselor Trell's scales had turned ash gray. Casualties? 312 civilians, I read from the report, mostly children and medical staff. Apparently the humans had just opened a new pediatric center. Congratulations, General. You've managed to turn us from bureaucratic annoyances into actual monsters. The chamber fell silent as the implication sank in. But their defenses, General Voro protested weakly, they were minimal. Our scans showed, their scans showed exactly what humans wanted them to show, I snapped, just like they've been doing since the beginning. And now, the words died in my throat as every screen in the chamber went dark. When they came back on, they showed only one thing, a timer counting down from 48. Zero o'clock. No demands, I noted quietly. No warnings, no Commander Blake with her polite smile. Just a countdown. Anyone want to guess what happens when it hits zero? We've tracked no unusual movement from Earth, one of the military advisors reported. No fleet mobilization, no. Of course not, I interrupted. Because if there's one thing we've learned, it's that we can absolutely trust our sensors when it comes to human activities. The next 48 hours were the longest of my life. Every attempt at communication with Earth or human colonies met with silence. Our long-range sensors remained offline. Short-range sensors showed nothing unusual, which only made it worse. At the 30-hour mark, we started getting strange readings from human space. 
energy signatures we'd never seen before, appearing and disappearing too fast to track. Like they're testing something, one of our scientists muttered, before being quickly hushed. At the 24-hour mark, we lost contact with our border outposts. Not destroyed, just unreachable, as if the space between us and them had somehow been gently folded away. They're isolating us, I realized, cutting us off section by section. At the 12-hour mark, the governing council of Nova Haven sent their only message since the attack. It was addressed to me personally. Ambassador Valos, as you were the only one who tried to understand us, we feel you deserve a warning. When humanity fights, we do not seek victory. We seek to ensure the lesson never needs teaching again. We regret what comes next. What does that mean, High Counselor Trell demanded, her composure finally cracking. It means, I replied, that we're about to learn why humans tell stories about patients running out. The final hour brought new readings that made our scientists weep. Space itself seemed to be changing around human territories, folding and unfolding in ways our best theories said were impossible. Energy readings are off the charts, a technician reported, but the patterns, they're not random. They're, they're, they're building something, I finished. Or maybe they're just finally showing us what they've already built. With one minute remaining, every communication system in Federation space activated simultaneously. No message, no demands. Just a soft, steady humming that made our teeth ache and our instruments go haywire. You know what the really funny part is? I said to no one in particular. We thought we were containing them. All this time, they were containing themselves, holding back, playing nice. The timer hit zero. For exactly three seconds, nothing happened. Just long enough for General Voro to start saying, see, they were blue. Then we saw it. Space rippled like water. And through those ripples came the human fleet. Not dozens of ships, not hundreds, thousands. Ships we'd never seen before. Ships that didn't show up on any sensors. Ships that moved through space like it was suggesting polite directions rather than enforcing laws of physics. And at their head, a single vessel that dwarfed our largest dreadnoughts. Its hull bore the name Enough in letters visible from light years away. The humming changed pitch, and with it, every Federation military vessel simply powered down. No explosions. No destruction. Just the gentle sound of thousands of ships going dark at once. A voice spoke through every communication system in Federation space. Not Commander Blake this time. Someone knew. This is Admiral Marcus Chen of the Earth Defense Fleet. You attacked our children, our hospitals. In doing so, you've answered a question we've been asking since we joined the galactic community. Could we coexist with those who see strength as an excuse for cruelty? We now have our answer. The massive ship moved forward and space moved with it. What follows, Admiral Chen continued, is not revenge, it is correction. I looked around the council chamber at the faces of the most powerful beings in known space, and saw something I'd never seen before. Fear. Well, I said to no one in particular, at least now we know what humans look like when they stop being patient. The humming grew louder. Let me tell you about the day the humans showed us what correction looks like. Picture the scene, the council chamber in chaos, diplomatic masks finally cracking, while outside, the largest fleet anyone had ever seen hung in space like a judgment made manifest. And that humming, that constant humming that made every artificial system in Federation space dance to Earth's tune. Admiral Chen's voice returned, calm as someone discussing the weather. For those wondering about your military vessels, we've temporarily borrowed their control systems. Don't worry, life support remains functional. We're not barbarians. I couldn't help but laugh at that. Several council members shot me horrified looks. Over the next 24 hours, Chen continued, we will demonstrate why attacking children was unwise. Pay attention. There will not be a second lesson. The massive ship, enough, moved forward. And reality, bent. There's no other way to describe it. Space folded around it like paper and suddenly it was simultaneously at every major Federation military installation. Quantum displacement technology, one of our scientists whispered in awe. They've militarized quantum entanglement on a macro scale. 
Really? I replied dryly. Is that what gave it away? The way they're treating the laws of physics like polite suggestions? Or the fact that their ships are everywhere and nowhere at once? The demonstration began with our proudest achievement, the Celestial Barrier, a massive energy shield protecting the Federation's core worlds. A shield we'd spent centuries perfecting. A small human vessel, barely larger than a shuttle, approached it. The humming changed pitch slightly, and the barrier rippled. Then it transformed into what appeared to be a spectacular light show. We've repurposed your barrier, Admiral Chen announced. It now generates sustainable energy for nearby civilian sectors. You're welcome. Next came our automated defense platforms. Thousands of them spread across Federation space. The human ships didn't destroy them. Instead, they reprogrammed them in seconds. Your defense platforms now serve as navigation beacons and emergency rescue stations, Chen explained. A much better use of resources, don't you think? Throughout it all, not a single shot was fired. No explosions, no destruction. Just the systematic repurposing of everything the Federation had built to protect itself. This is impossible, General Voro muttered, his cybernetics glitching badly. Our security systems... Oh, about those, Chen interrupted, somehow hearing the comment. Your encryption? Very impressive. For binary systems. We've been using quantum-based computing for decades, but we kept using your outdated protocols in our official communications. Didn't want to spoil the surprise. The humming shifted again and every screen in Federation space displayed the same image. Nova Haven. But not the attack colony. This was live footage of Nova Haven restored, rebuilt, better than before. The entire process had taken less than an hour. We've taken the liberty of updating your construction technology as well, Chen noted. Your building codes were rather restrictive. High Counselor Trell finally found her voice. What do you want from us? Want? Chen's voice carried a hint of amusement. We don't want anything from you. This isn't a negotiation or a conquest. This is a remedial lesson in consequences. For instance, the humming peaked, and suddenly every piece of Federation military technology simply transformed. Weapons became medical equipment. Warships turned into hospital ships and scientific vessels. Combat satellites morphed into environmental restoration platforms. There, Chen said, satisfied. Much better. Now let's discuss the new reality. The massive ship enough somehow managed to be visible from every Federation world simultaneously. A reminder that physics itself had taken humanity's side. The Federation as you knew it is over. Your military has been repurposed for peaceful applications. Your bureaucracy has been streamlined. You're welcome, by the way. Your trade restrictions have been adjusted. You can't just... Someone in the chamber began. We just did, Chen interrupted. But here's the interesting part. We're not taking over. We're not establishing an Earth-led government. We're simply ensuring certain behaviors won't be repeated. The humming finally stopped, and in its absence, the silence felt heavy with possibility. From this point forward, Chen declared, any species that attacks civilians, especially children, will face immediate correction. Not from Earth, but from everyone. We're sharing enough of our technology to ensure universal enforcement. Consider it a form of galactic immune system. The screen shifted to show the new reality. Federation worlds continuing their daily lives, but with subtle changes. Faster transport. Better healthcare. More efficient everything. In short, Chen concluded, we've given you an upgrade. Forcefully, yes, but you rather insisted on learning things the hard way. Oh, and one more thing. Every Federation citizen's personal device activated simultaneously, displaying a simple message. Welcome to Galactic Society 2.0. Terms and conditions include, don't be horrible to each other. Save further questions for Ambassador Valos. He at least tried to warn you. I looked at my suddenly very active communication device and sighed. Thanks for that, Admiral. Really appreciate the extra workload. Consider it a promotion, Chen replied cheerfully. Someone needs to explain to everyone how being decent to each other works. You volunteered by being the only one who saw this coming? The human fleet began to fold space again, preparing to depart. Oh, an ambassador? Chen added. 
We're still sending those gift baskets, but now they'll include instruction manuals for all the upgraded technology, assuming anyone bothers to read them this time. As the fleet disappeared in a display of physics-defying grace, I turned to the stunned council. So, I said brightly, who wants to help me draft the Hello Everything's Different Now announcement? No one laughed. But then again, no one was supposed to. Not yet. It's been one standard year since what's now called the correction. And I'm still getting messages from beings who can't quite believe how it all turned out. But they could have destroyed us, they say. They could have taken control of everything. And that's the part they still don't understand. The humans never wanted to destroy or control. They just wanted everyone to stop being awful to each other. It was probably the most sophisticated timeout in galactic history. Here's what the history records won't tell you. The humans knew what they were capable of from the very beginning. Every trade violation, every creative interpretation of our rules, every seemingly harmless bending of regulations, it was all a test. Not of their capabilities, but of our responses. They wanted to see if we could learn, adapt, grow. We failed, spectacularly. But instead of punishment, they gave us transformation. Our mighty Federation military, now the galaxy's largest humanitarian aid force, our bureaucratic maze of trade restrictions, replaced with what humans call common sense guidelines. Though I'm still not sure where the common part comes from. The really funny part? Everything runs better now. Turns out when you remove artificial barriers and focus on actually helping people, things improve. Who knew? Well, humans knew apparently. They still send those gift baskets every week like clockwork. Now they include little notes. Great job on the new medical distribution network or loving what you did with the education system upgrade. It's practically passive aggressive, except it's genuine. They're actually proud of us, like parents watching their kids finally learn to play nice with others. Admiral Chen sends personal messages sometimes, always starts them with, hey, remember that time we had to rewrite physics in front of everyone to make a point? I'm never sure if he's joking or not, probably both. So here's my warning to future generations. Humans aren't patient because they're weak. They're patient because they're strong enough to wait for others to learn. But that patience isn't infinite. If you're reading this and thinking about testing their limits, don't. Just don't. Look up at the sky instead. See those stars? Somewhere out there is a ship named Enough, ready to remind everyone why being decent to each other isn't just nice. It's necessary. Or as Commander Blake put it in her last message to me, the universe is too beautiful for ugliness to win. Sometimes you just need to adjust people's perspective, preferably before they do something stupid like attacking children. Me? I've got a new job title now. Galactic Administrator of Getting Along with Each Other. The humans suggested it. I'm pretty sure they're laughing about it. But you know what? It works. And that's really what humans do best. They make things work, even if they have to rewrite the rules of reality to do it. Just remember, they're still out there, still watching, still sending those gift baskets. And they're still really, really good at running out of patience. End of report. Now, if you'll excuse me, I have a new basket to open. I hear they're including quantum physics for beginners this time. 